Vinayak, has everybody joined? Shall we uh, begin now or what is the situation? Uh, yes, sir. We'll start now. Yeah. We can start. All yes. right. Uh, uh, all, the, all the students joined, sir, from Parikrama and uh, Jakur PU College and Vidyavardhaka Sangha, VVS institutions from Bangalore and JNV Mahe and uh, Iduki. And uh, they have sent the message, sir. Very right, nice. Uh, very nice. We'll start. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Ravi Manjitaya. I'm an associate professor here in uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research in a, a department called Molecular Biology and Genetics Unit. And I work on cell biology. And uh, some of your students I have met at some point of time. So it's a warm welcome to all of you. Um, uh, you know, this is these are COVID times. And I think only some of the good things about this COVID times is that we get to have such a big, uh, large number of audience schools joining from various parts of the country today. And so it's a really nice opportunity for all of you to sit and listen to some of the uh, latest work that is happening, uh, research that is happening in the world by one of the world leaders. Okay, So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, speaker, uh, Professor Ravi Mudda Shetty, whom I have known for a while now. Uh, Professor Ravi Mudda Shetty is an associate professor here in Bangalore in Indian Institute of Science campus uh, at the Center for Brain Research. So as you can know that he's a brain scientist or a neuroscientist, and uh, his interest is to understand how proteins are made in the neurons. And prior to this, he uh, did his PhD in you know, after doing his master's and all. He did his PhD from Germany, from the University of Münster. And then he went to USA um, at Emory University, Atlanta, to do uh, post PhD or uh, post doctoral work. Okay, and since then um, his interests have been to understand uh, what is so special about the way proteins are made in neurons and what makes them unique. Um, so in in scientific terms, it's called understanding uh, regulation of activity mediated protein synthesis in neurons and how it affects development and function of the nervous system. I think you must have heard about the nervous system. And in particular, he is not only interested in understanding how normally these things happen, but in disease conditions such as a neurodevelopmental disorder called fragile X syndrome and neurodegenerative disease such as Alzheimer's disease. He is interested in uh, studying how protein synthesis in neurons um, has an impact. But today he's also going to talk to you, I believe, about something that everybody loves to hear and want to know more and more. And they think it's the magic drug for everything is uh, stem cells. So what are stem cells? How are they so famous? Why are they so famous? And what are the promises that one can think about in the future of coming from stem cells? Uh, Professor Ravi Mudda Shetty will tell you all about it today. OK, without further much ado, uh, Professor Ravi Mutashetti, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Ravi. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. I'll also, I thank the CNR Rao uh, Hall of Science for inviting me to give this talk. So uh, I did give this talk uh, a few and That's something I would really miss it today. I really would have loved to have this talk offline where I could Hello, ask, let you guys ask me question during the talk and have more interactive uh, session, but we had to make do with what we have uh, given the situation. But I'm really glad to know that many uh, schools and colleges could uh, uh, join because it's an online uh, talk. Um, with that, let Ravi, me, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I just forgot to make an announcement to all the students. Okay, um, here are the instructions because of the current situation. Uh, Professor Ravi Mutashetti will give the entire lecture, uh, his talk, uh, uninterrupted at this point of time. So my suggestion is the following, that all of you may have some paper, pen, or on your phone. Whatever questions you have, please write it down, and you pass it on to your uh, teachers who are there, who are accessing the uh, online system. And in the WebEx system, we have a chat window. So in the chat window, please, Write down your name from which school and uh, school and uh, place you are from, and do write your question very briefly. What you would like to know, 
and so at the end of the presentation professor ravi mudashetty will answer the most interesting questions all right ravi back to you thank you again thank, thank you ravi so yeah i really look forward to listen to your question that for me the most exciting part please ask me questions okay let me start so at any given point of time you might have asked yourself who are we what are we made up of okay so who are we is a much difficult question and it's even more like you know more of a philosophy question of philosophy so let's leave that alone we will ask what are we made up of this is much easier to answer we are made up of cells okay so to go a little bit like you no know, uh, zoom out we are actually made up of our organs okay we are made up of we are whatever brain is right we are our whatever brain is but we are also whatever stomach is which is very very important okay and of course there are other not so interesting organs like heart lungs etc each of this organ but if you zoom in and see though they look very very different heart lungs brain all look very very different but you look more closely each of them are made up of cells heart is made up of many kinds of cell including the heart muscles and of course you have many other skeletal muscles then you have liver then you have liver has very typical liver cell hepatocytes and then you have kidney which has beautiful kidney cell and of course brain which is my my favorite organ which has made up of billions of very very fantastic fascinating looking cells called neurons irrespective of that every organ is made up of distinct kind of cells and all our body is just nothing but cells so basically we are our cells cells are the fundamental functional unit of our body and are the functional unit of any living organism okay so let's start that discussion with that okay but since we are focusing on humans we are made up of cells but what kind of cells do you know what is the most numerous cell in our body will be surprised that it is not even our cell the most numerous cell in our body is actually bacteria so you can you see here this is the average number of cells present in a 70 kg average person so in that person the maximum number of cells actually what's there inside the, uh, it's it could be inside your gut it could be on, in on the, your uh, skin your uh, uh, mouth everywhere bacteria are everywhere and they are the most numerous cells in your body but let's forget them for today's discussion we are not talking about bacteria or virus covid for that matter thankfully we are talking about our own cells when we come to our own cells the maximum number of cells are actually red blood cells which comprises the more than like you know 90% of it all other cells only made up make up for 5% but then you go to the bottom side now this gives actually the weight though the 95% of your cells are red blood cells they will make up only 3 kg in a 70 70 kg person they only make up of 3 kg actually the maximum weight is made up by your muscles because muscle, muscles are much long and big cells okay all other cells and second biggest is actually adipocytes adipocytes is your fat cells fat storing cells they make up for 13 kg you may be surprised like you know you add up all these things that doesn't make and now see here though the bacteria are the most numerous when it comes to the weight they only make up 0.2 kg so what it tells is the kinds of cells we have are very 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 diverse some may be very numerous but very small while some other are numerically less but they are very very large okay we comprise very very many different kind of cells so if somebody of you if you are quickly adding up this and say oh ravi but they are not adding up to 70 kg yes they are not it's only given the weight of the cells but there is material outside the cell that is called extracellular material which makes up for actually maximum that is 24 kg if you add up all this thing it will come to 70 so once again i emphasize we are made up of cells but we are made up of very very many different kind of cells at the last count it is more than 200 different kind of cells human body is made up of and they vary very hugely yeah 
So I think it's a common thing. All of you know it and all of you like, you know, it's a very, very trivial. You may think it's very trivial, but look into it a little bit more carefully. Okay. For example, heart. Heart is made up of many kinds of cells. Most important, your heart muscle cell, which make your heart keep beating, right? And then there are also like many other cells. Actually, uh, it also make up the blood vessel and all those things. Okay. Then you come to brain. Brain is the one which thinks and make you do all the things what you want to do and make you listen to my boring talk, etc. Brain is made up of billions of neurons. Okay, these neurons are very beautiful structure, very structurally, very distinct kind of uh, like, you know, feature they have. But again, there are so many hundreds of different kind of neurons. Each one looks very different and do very different kind of functions like sensory neuron, motor neuron and non-neuronal cells like astrocyte. Then you have kidney. Kidney have this beautiful, like, you know, amazing looking cells, which is very distinct and highly specialized to do its function. So these cells are very, very structurally, functionally distinct. Like, you know, heart cells are made to do its function to pump blood. They cannot think at the same time. Brain can think. It can think everything and imagine everything in the world, but it cannot pump blood. Similarly, these cells may not think, but it purifies all the toxins in your body. So these cells are functionally, structurally very, 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 very distinct, right? But just go back. So you are all now grown up, okay? I like, you know, physiologically you are all adults. But go back from where did you come? It is amazing that while we are all made up of so many distinct kinds of cells, all these cells come from one single cell and that single cell is zygote. So what is zygote? Zygote is the one which is a fertilized egg. When egg is fertilized from sperm, the, nu the nucleus and the DNA of the sperm go into the egg and that get fused with the egg and this will become a zygote. Okay. The zygote is the starting material for all of us. Okay. So then what happens? Once the zygote, the once the egg is fertilized and you have the zygote, the zygote start dividing. It was one single cell, then it start dividing into two, four, eight, sixteen, goes on. While it is going on dividing into this many cell, even when it reaches about hundreds of cell, these cell, each of this cell is completely pluripotent. What do I mean by completely pluripotent? I just mentioned we are made up of 200 different kind of cells and we need all these 200 different kind of cells to do normal function. What I mean by pluripotent means until when they are like a, about like, you know, 200 or 300 cells, each of this cell, if you take and allow it to grow, each of the cell can make entire of you. Every kind of 200 cells, the cells can make. Okay. So until this stage, each cell is completely pluripotent. That means it can make any kind of cells. But after that, till then you don't have any distinct structure, right? But after this, you start developing organs. You start developing your legs, heart, brain, etc., etc., etc. As the time grows, each of these organs develop very distinct shape and start functioning. Okay. What is most interesting thing is, it's not at the one cell stage, but even at the hundred cell stage, you still have the capacity that each of this cell can make every part of your body. So these are called pluripotent cells. But as we grow, the pluripotent cells will disappear. You start having more specialized organs. So just to give you a little bit more scientific explanation. So when the egg is fertilized, you have a single cell. But when the cell, this zygote is divided up to several hundred cells, these hundred cells are still very potent that can make any kind of cells. So these are called pluripotent. But as the time grow, they divide into three different kinds of layer. They are called ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Once they divide into ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm, they no longer remain pluripotent. That means they cannot make every organ. But still each of these cells can make multiple organs because for example, the ectodermal cells can still make brain and skin, both. Okay. Similarly, endoderm can make gut, lungs, liver. Mesoderm can blood, make blood, muscle and more. So they can still make multiple kinds of organs, but not all the organs. At this stage, they are called multipotents. But once they differentiate further and make your heart, lungs or whatever cell, 
then they are finally terminally differentiated they cannot be divided further they cannot be changed further okay so i want to give an analogy so who are pluripotent in our society are among the people who are listening to this talk you guys students i'm assuming all the students are from like you know 10th 11th 12th you guys are actually pluripotent so what do you mean by pluripotent means you are the ones who have the ability to become anything so you are completely like you know have the potential to change yourself and differentiate it to anything you want but probably in one or two years you will go into particular stream for example maybe let's say you go to basic science or you may go to engineering or may go to medical of course there are many other streams also but just for example but once you get into these streams then your potency is kind of limited okay if you go into basic science of course you still go to different branches of science but kind of you are limited to science if you go to engineering you are kind of limited to technology and if you go to medicine you are kind of limited to like you know uh, the medicine uh, field that means you still can go to different uh, uh, like you know part of the career but your potential to go do anything is kind of limited at this stage you are multipotent but now you finish your uh, like you know courses you become scientist then you choose a specialty like you know you become a physicist microbiologist chemist or neurobiologist like me or you become civil computer or aeronautic engineer even in medicine you become like you know dermatologist or neurosurgeon then actually you are finally fully terminally differentiated that means your potential you are so super specialized that your potential to become something else has completely diminished okay so why does this happen so why from pluripotent all the way we become terminally differentiated because as you enter into different line, uh, line of uh, like you know studies your mental like you know study will be focused only onto that line so you are specialized as you go further you will be specialized and how it is in the there are two very interesting question what is so special about pluripotent that they can become anything that's one first question second question once you are terminally differentiated can you differentiate back i mean is it possible for me to become a plus 2 student is it possible for me to become a pluripotent uh, uh, person i really wish i can but is it that easy Why, what stops it those these are the some of the question i want to talk okay first thing why we will differentiate differentiate into anything once we are in a pluripotent stage why we will differentiate into or even how we will differentiate into terminally differentiated forms like you know from pluripotent cell how will you become heart how will you become brain and so on so i think this i am assuming is a like you know knowledge all of you already have from your schools all our material all our the information to become anything is stored in the form of genes okay and this information is in the form stored in the form of dna which is in our nucleus so i'm assuming all of you are familiar with this so the genes and that is the chromosome of the cell each cell have a complete set of chromosome right complete set of information so whether you become heart or lung all that information is there in every cell so but why some cell become heart some cell become lungs that is how they differentiate like you know not every cell express every gene there are more than 20000 of proteins and more number of rna molecules so the combination of this proteins and rna molecule ultimately determine whether you become a heart cell or a lung cell or a brain cell but when you start differentiation let's say like you know in the very beginning you can become anything but as the time goes it even depends on the where you are sitting in your classroom if you are sitting in the front bench a different set of genes will be expressed if you are sitting in the middle a different and if you are sitting in the last bench different because it may be the air which is coming from the window it may be you are listening due to a talk or maybe you are passing a chit so where you are sitting actually determine a lot what you become at least in case of embryo right because the environment where you are sitting and what you can listen and what you can respond to make you what you are so in case of cells these are the factors as they like you know as the embryo grows as i told you there will be like you know bunch of cells but they start organizing into different layers depending on which layer you are you will become either brain heart or lung okay so because 
only in that layer some protein will be expressed because it is exposed to certain environment in, and that small number of proteins slowly expand to become more and more but as they become more and more they can only go in one way not in other way. so where you are sitting and what you are listening to makes up what you become okay so this is exactly and put it in a very very simple term that's how the differentiation happens and this most of the time is one way street okay so once they start becoming something they cannot suddenly change they keep on going in the same lineage okay so there are but we will not talk so much about how the pluripotent cell become heart or lung okay that's when your developmental biology you will study what is more fascinating okay there are cells in our body which can make anything they are really the magical cells if so what are they so these are the pluripotent stem cell which can make anything and everything okay that i already told you but these are there only in the very beginning of your life when you are an embryo only for few days all your cells have this potency as you grow slowly this pluripotent cells stop uh, like start disappearing by the time your embryo is developed and you are born most of your pluripotent stem cells are gone pluripotent stem cell are the one which will make all your organs right they can make brain heart lung but as we grow old they start giving trouble or you may have congenital issues because of your heredity your heart may not function properly or they start uh, giving troubles when you are 20 once you are 30 or once you are 40 okay then what can we do so let's let me let me just give an analogy here of a car Let's say you have a car, obviously car runs beautifully in the first two years, but as it goes, as the time passes, it starts giving trouble. It may have trouble with the engine, it may have trouble with the gearbox, or it may have trouble with the tire, like that. So what you do? When your car has trouble, first you try to like, you know, repair the engine or repair the gearbox. But beyond, if it goes beyond repair, what you do? You take it to the mechanic and say, no, sir, it can't be repaired, please replace it. So, you just go to the shop, buy a new thing, replace it, and it can function like new. Can we do it with our organs? Why not? Why can't we do it with our organs? Because I said, at the very beginning of your life, you have cells which have the potency to make anything and everything. If that is the thing, why can't we have those cells and make them, program them to make anything you want and replace? If your heart is start giving trouble, replace it with new heart because you can make them. You have the cells which can make the heart. Is it possible? So, the stem cell biology and whatever we have learned from past, say, 30, 40 years about stem cell says, please take the word, listen to the word properly, says that it is definitely possible. We can definitely make, extract this stem cell, make any of the organ, and re if you start having problem, you can replace this organ. Okay? Fine. But I said, like, you know, as we grow, the pluripotent stem cells disappear. If they are disappearing, how can they extract them? The whole thing looks like a fantasy. Like, you know, it's like, you know, a science movie. How can we extract these cells that if they are disappearing? Yes, we can extract them. Where you can extract them? From embryo. Because this is the embryonic stem cell. Because they are coming from your zygote. Only when they are in a very early stage of development, they retain the pluripotency. If you can extract them from there, then you can make. What you can make? As I said, if you can get this cell, if you know how to program them, then you program them to make, you extract this cell and program them to make brain, lung, heart, liver, any of this uh, cell, and they can put it back. Okay. So these are cells. Can we make heart from them? Yes. That is possible if not entire heart part of the heart or if not entire brain part of the brain so because we not only know that this pluripotent cell exists we also know how they become from pluripotent to heart brain and lungs so if you use that program because i told you it's all because of the expression of gene and the expression of the gene is determined by an external environment what kind of environment you give so if you know which genes and if you know what environment trigger them then you can extract the pluripotent cells, put them in a dish and give that environment, then you can get your desired organ. This is totally possible. Okay. And if you can do that, 
if you can extract this pluripotent stem cell and you have the ability to uh, make them into organ what are the like you know advantage and where you can actually find them and what you can do them okay first thing though we are talking so much about stem cell the embryonic stem cell which we are like you know the uh, um, the, the center of all the talk i am like you know telling so far were not we were not able to extract them until the late 90s and beginning of 2000 so because they are very few only and they are present in the very early stage of development so what you have to do you have to fertilize the egg by sperms then the zygote will be formed in the first three four days it will divide and at about six day it form a structure called blastosis blastosis will have this like you know ring like structure which again made up of cell but inside this ring like structure you will have few hundred to thousand cells and these are the cells which you can extract and if you extract them very carefully and plate it in a suitable environment they will attach to the plate and they start growing and once they start growing you can grow them forever if you give the proper environment they grow forever and retain their pluripotency so the whole point is you should be able to catch them at the right time and you should provide them the right environment that you can grow them outside your like in you know, a body so this is totally possible okay so now this technique is established you can extract embryonic stem cell of course it started with mouse and rat and other organism but we can now successfully extract the embryonic stem cell from human and grow them and you can have human embryonic stem cell so imagine we can grow any of the human organs and human cells from this so what exactly we do so as i told you you take the egg obviously you cannot do from them like you know in body this thing this has to be done outside okay this is in vitro fertilization you take the egg and you fertilize with a sperm then you start growing them outside in the test tube then they will divide into few cells but once they form this blastosis then you know that you have the inner inside the blastosis this cell so very carefully delicately enter into this region extract these cells without damaging then you plate them in a plate and provide them the right kind of environment as it is in the embryo then they start growing and then they can you can immortalize them so that they can grow forever so once you harvest them and start growing them then you can differentiate them as i told you you give a certain factor to make them like you know to ectoderm so basically our body is made up of three kinds of layer ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm so once you start growing the embryonic stem cell you can delicately nudge them to go to one of the three layers okay so once you nudge them to go to endoderm then so they become the endoderm cell the, let's say they become ectoderm cell then slowly they give a very specific kind of factor to either become skin cell or become neuron once they start growing into neuron again you nudge them further to become one specific kind of neuron which is important either for your memory or the neuron important for your movements and so on so slowly slowly at every step you nudge them to become one particular kind of cell you start from a pluripotent cell slowly you nudge them to become one kind of very specialized kind of cells okay so how do you do this you get the cells and put them in a plate okay if you grow them in a plate they will not like you know they will not grow into your organ so you have to give them the right kind of matrix so you may want to grow them like you know each of your organ is not made up of one kind of cells right each of your organ is made up of multiple kind of cells but these cells if you don't uh, like you know properly nudge them they will only grow into one kind of cells to avoid that what you do like for example brain is made up of brain, neurons and glia so you can make two kinds of neurons and glia but put them together so they grow as it is in the brain so you can do that that's called co-culture or you can do another thing you just put all the embryonic stem cell give program give the factors as the brain uh, uh, the factors that brain received during the development so then actually they can cluster together and start growing as if it is a brain okay there is of course limitation this is not exactly brain so but it can look a lot like brain function lot like brain. so actually you can grow them in a 3d culture or co-cultures or scaffolds to mimic the organs which is in your body okay 
So this is just to show what we do. I will not exactly go into what the, uh, my lab uh, research is, just to show that we are also doing this thing in our lab. For example, we take the embryonic stem cells. So this is how they look. You take the embryonic stem cell, grow them in a plate, they grow like a colony. That means they will have all stick together and they will have a distinct boundary, right? They look absolutely shapeless. They don't have any distinct shape. Now, you start nudging them, giving a very right kind of program. Within three months, they become human neurons. So these are finally completely mature human neurons, beautiful human neurons. These are my students who have the capability to make different kind of neurons and also glia and all those things. So we routinely do this in the lab. So we can make this. And also this is not just beautiful uh, cells that are functional. What neuron does is they generate this electric impulse. They talk to each other through this electric impulse. And whatever we neurons we made from embryonic stem cell also generate the same kind of electric impulse. That means these are the functional neuron, functional human neurons. Okay, so what is the advantage? Say, you make all these things. What is the advantage of making all these things? One thing, of course, you can use them for your scientific research. Of course, we want to know how these pluripotent stem cells divide into different layers of our body, from different layers, how they become distinct organ, how this whole process of differentiation happens. Understanding this is very important because this is important to know what goes wrong during normal development. This is one of the things. Of course, you can generate organs. If the organ, if your brain is not functioning, a distinct part of your brain is not functioning, you can make neuron and transplant. Or for example, cornea, if there is a problem with your cornea, eye cornea, you can replace it. Or many organs can be easily made and replaced. And more than that, you want to develop a drug that you want to test it. You can't test it on mouse or any other organism because it may be human specific. Then you can actually test it on human cell, not only any cell, any kind of cell you want, you can test the drug using the embryonic stem cell. So these are just some of the example, like you can do the uh, toxicology screen, you can use it as research. And now the, the, the newest fancy thing, you can make the 3D printing, right? 3D weaving and 3D printing. For that, you need to have starting material. Let's say you can make a 3D uh, uh, printing of your heart. For that, you have to have the embryonic stem cell, which can differentiate into cardiomyocyte, which you can use to make the 3D printing. This is still at a very nascent stage, but it's totally possible to do it. And of course, you can use it for stem cell therapy. For example, if there is a person has leukemia, all his blood cell can be replaced by transplanting the stem cell, which can make the blood. So if the original blood cells have problem, totally remove them transplant from the stem cell, which may, can make all the blood cells. So that can completely cure the leukemia. So you can transplant all kinds of cells and make all kind of organs. So these are the advantage of pluripotent stem cells, particularly embryonic stem cells. So all this looks very beautiful and fancy, but there are huge roadblocks in this, huge roadblocks in the research on the embryonic stem cell. What are these? Things? The biggest problem is actually ethical issue. Why there is ethical issue? Because the way we extract embryonic stem cells, embryonic stem cells, I said, for to extract them, you have to get an egg and you have to fertilize. You have to get a human egg and you have to fertilize with human sperms. Then what you get is actually embryo. You have to grow them outside in your test tube at a particular stage, actually extract. That means this is dead. This embryo is dead. To think very carefully, actually you are killing a life. Because once the egg is fertilized, it can be considered as a life. You are actually killing a human being to extract these cells. And this is ethically wrong according to most of the society. Most of the governments are actually banned, are highly restricted this kind of research. Because this actually you are killing an embryo to extract. Apart from that, actually there are a lot of practical issues because even if you do all this thing, the number of cells you extract is very small and your ability to make any of the thing which I told you will be very, very limited. Because of this, though it's a very, very fascinating thing, using embryonic stem cells to do all these things what I told is very, very difficult. So you should find a way to get the pluripotent cell which is not exactly extracted from embryo. What can we do for that? So one way we can do that is by cloning, okay? Because to extract your embryonic stem cell, you have to go to embryo. So that's a problem, right? But if you are an adult, 
If somebody want to take 5 ml of your blood or want to take a piece of your skin, nobody objects to that. Because these are somatic cells, nothing happens to you. You are not killed to while you are taking a skin. Then, is it possible to convert these cells into pluripotent cells? This is like asking, is it possible for me, who is a neurobiologist now, to become a plus two student? Is it possible for me to reprogram myself to become a plus two student? Okay, which is not very easy. I tell you, I, I can tell like, you know, as much as I fancy that I want to become a plus two student, it's not easy. But there is really tremendous advancement in the science that has actually made it possible. It, now, if I think like, you know, at least, at the, if I was a cell, it was possible for me to go back and become polypotent. How? So there were two major advancements happened. First one is actually not directly converting the somatic cells into pluripotent, but take the somatic cell, fuse it with a pluripotent and make that cell pluripotent. What exactly do you do here? Okay. So as I told you, only the embryonic cells have the ability to be pluripotent. Why they are, only they have the ability? Both your embryonic cell and your mature cell have the same genetic material. What is different is the environment at which this uh, the genetic material is. The environment which em the embryo is, is very different from the em environment in your uh, final mature cell is. But then people thought, but the genetic material is same. What happens if I take the genetic material of the somatic cell and remove the genetic material from the egg cell, and put this genetic material into this egg cell, is it possible to capture the pluripotency of the stem cell, but have the genetic material of the somatic cell? Are you following? Like, you know, you take a egg, egg you can take, like, you know, but, uh, but, but it will carry the features of the egg, but take your skin cell, take the nucleus of your skin cell, fuse it with the egg, and can you have the clone which actually resembles you rather than the egg? So this is called somatic nuclear transfer technology. And this was developed again in the late 90s. And one of the most famous uh, uh, outcome of this is a sheep called Dolly. So in this, what they did, they take the mammary cells from the udder of one sheep. Okay. Then they extracted the egg. Uh, this is, please remember, this is the unfertilized egg from another sheep. From this sheep egg, the egg, they actually remove the nuclei. Then from this, actually the cell's nucleus, they fuse with this egg. So this cell egg contains the nucleus of this sheep. Now they stimulated it in such a way, it will grow into, because it is an egg. If you fuse with the nucleus, it will think it's actually an embryo. It starts growing into an embryo. At the blastocyst level, they put this back into the ovary of another surrogate uh, uh, lamb and from that born a baby called Dolly, which is exact photocopy of this sheep because all the genetic material in this is actually because all of us slightly differ from our parents because all our genetic material is a combination of mother and father. In this case, what they are doing, take your father's cell, fuse with a mother, but nu remove the nucleus. So you are exact copy of your father. You have no characteristic of your mother. So this is called clone. So the Dolly was not the first animal to be cloned. This was the first mammal to be cloned. But this was done much earlier in the late 50s and 60s with the frog and many other invertebrates. Now, after Dali, many other mammals have also been cloned. Very recently, even monkeys were cloned this way. So theoretically, you can clone any animal using this technology. And of course, you can clone humans. And that's where the problem is. Because can you clone human? I really, really want to know your opinion. What is your opinion about cloning in human? But whatever is your opinion, I really want to have an open, uh, like, you know, this thing saying, like, you know, is this right or wrong? But most of the governments have banned. It's not allowed to clone humans. So this still is an advantage, but it has limitation because you still it is technically very difficult and still you have ethical issues. Now, what's the uh, uh, other way by which we can get the pluripotent cells? Okay. As I said, you start with pluripotent cell and differentiate into mature cells, right? Your neuron or any kind of mature cell. Why they mature? In the early part of all the, like, you know, pluripotent cell and differentiated cells have the same genetic material. But 
the genes which are expressed in your pluripotent cell are very different from the genes which are expressed in your mature cell. So let's say, just for the example, let's say, when the cells were pluripotent, they were expressing gene A and B. Through this slow nudging process, by the time you become differentiated cells, you are actually expressing a very different set of genes, that is genes C and D. Because of genes C and D, you are a differentiated cell. But now, the question is, you take the somatic cell, Force the, sorry, force this domatic cell to express gene A and B, which were there in the pluripotent cell. Then, is it possible to convert the differentiated cell back into pluripotent cell? This theoretically very sounds very simple, but it's very difficult to identify which are the genes which are only expressed in the pluripotent, which can be reprogrammed. So, this took a very, very long time to actually practically do this. And the person who actually did this is a great scientist from uh, uh, Japan, uh, Shinya Emanaka, and his colleagues. So they were able to do exactly this. So what did they do? Say they went on to pluripotent. They identified many groups of bunches of uh, pluripotent cells. Then they went on to look what exactly the genes express only in pluripotent, which is not expressed anywhere else. So they went on doing lots and lots and uh, lots of laborious study, and they identified there are few hundreds. Then they went to do a lot of in silico study. Out of this few hundred, how many are actually important to maintain them as a pluripotent, right? And through all this analysis, they identified actually about 24 genes are essential to keep the cell as pluripotent. Then they, what they did, they took a fibroblast. They took a cells from skin. They plated them and used all this 24 factor to see whether they convert them back into pluripotent cell. Luckily enough, they were able to do it. So, though it's a very small number, if you start with 1000 cells, only one or two will be converted back, back into pluripotent. But they could, because they could do it, slowly they, then they start, okay, 24 is a kind of a log, very large number. It's very cumbersome to do 24. Slowly, slowly they started eliminating. They instead of 24, 23, 22, 21. Like that elimination process, they went on for years. Finally, they identified actually you need only four factors. You take a mature somatic cell, make them to force them to express these four factors, then they will become pluripotent cell. They will be like totally like your embryonic stem cell. They have all the potency to make any kinds of cell in your body. So this is part. These are pluripotent cells, but you are actually inducing them to become pluripotent. So they are called induced pluripotent stem cells. So these are the four factors which are essential and sufficient to make the pluripotent cells. These are called Yamanaka factors. They are named after the person who identified these factors. These are called Yamanaka factors. So what exactly they do? They take the somatic cells. They will actually grow them in one kind of toxin. Okay. So normal cells cannot grow. Then for these cells, they make them, force them to express these four factors. So the advantage of these four factors, these four factors also carry a way to get rid of the toxin. So now majority of the cells die because of the toxin. Only the cells which forced to express these factors can survive. So as you can see, in the beginning, majority of the cells will die. Out of the millions of cells, only few cells will survive. Okay. But these cells, the world, whichever cells survive, they grow them for long enough, each of them will become an individual cell. Then all the cells divided from these cells can grow in the toxin and all those cells are coming from one single cell. So then they are called clones. See, as you can see them, they grow as colony coming out of single cell and you can grow them far enough, then they become clear clones. Now you can just go into the plate, pluck them, put it in a new plate that will become a complete separate clone. From this, you can grow anything that you want. All the things which you could do from your pluripotent cell, you can grow them. So the huge advantage of this is actually, you can do everything what I already told you from uh, the clone, you can, uh, the pluripotent stem cell, you can do it. The advantage is you don't have to go to the embryo. You don't have to go through that very difficult process to extract. You can just take any cell. And also advantage, see, the embryo is an embryo from one particular person. It's not you. You cannot make a clone of you. Now you can, because you can take your own cell and make it pluripotent. It is your own pluripotent cell. And from that, you can make your own brain, your own lungs, your own heart, etc. 
So this is a huge technological advancement compared to the embryonic uh, stem cell. Another thing is embryonic uh, stem cell, as I told you, is very difficult to extract. Hardly you can get hundreds from the embryo, right? But here, once you can convert your skin cell, skin cell is cheap, or your blood is cheap, very easy to extract. If you can convert them, and if you can make them grow, you have almost have an unlimited supply. You can make every once uh, once in a year, you decide I want a new heart. You can you have a new heart? I mean, at least in theory. So this become unlimited and unlimited supply of your own pluripotent cells. And you can again do everything that is possible to do with pluripotent stem cell, like embryonic stem cell, using iPSCs. Beyond that, it also has another huge advantage. That is, for example, you want to study a genetic disease. Many of the genetic diseases are very unique to human. Many of the neurodegenerative diseases, autism spectrum, they are very unique to human. It's very difficult to study it in animal models. Now, and also even among human, it varies so much. If I just say Alzheimer, my Alzheimer could be very different from another person's Alzheimer. Now, how do I study exactly one person's Alzheimer? What exactly goes wrong in that? It's very difficult to do until now. But now, because also Alzheimer happens in the neuron, and neuron, as you know, it's impossible to grow. But now it is possible because you can take the skin cell of an Alzheimer patient, and from that skin cell, you can convert them into pluripotent stem cell, and from that pluripotent stem cell, you can make the neuron. So you actually are right now studying the neuron of an Alzheimer patient without going into his brain. Now you can do all the study from the neuron of the patient and you can make the stem cell models of any disease, any genetic disease, any non-genetic disease also. And you can totally personalize the, uh, uh, the, the medical study and even the uh, drug treatment for that person. Okay. So this is a huge advan uh, advancement because you can identify and make the stem cell model for each disease from human. So another very important advantage, as, as you can see here, once you take the cells and make them into neuron, but they have a problem because you know genetically there's something wrong. But how can we exactly know what is wrong? But using this cell, if you know what is genetically wrong, you can go to that genes and actually correct that genes. Now you have the corrected genes, you have the mutant genes. So it has two advantages. One, you can use the corrected and mutant gene to see what actually going wrong. Also, another very important advantage is if you can correct the gene and if you can grow these cells and that mutation is actually causing all the problem. Now, instead of mutant cell, you can transplant these cells back into that person because the cell is actually coming from the same person. The body will not reject it. Majority of the problem with transplantation is body will reject it because of the immune re response because this cell is made from the same person. The body will not reject it and it can correct all the problems. So this is a huge advantage. How exactly, and this will be the, the last uh, slide before I stop. So how exactly you correct it is like this. If you know where exactly the mutation is, there are something called molecular scissors. The technical name, the scientific name for this is CRISPR-Cas9. So this is a kind of an enzyme. So this enzyme acts like a scissor. It go and cut your DNA. But the good thing is you can put an address to this scissor. The scissor knows exactly where to go and cut. Now you identify the mistake in the gene, put that address into your molecular scissor, put it into your cell that will go and cut that region. At the same time, that part, you can send a corrected part of the gene. Then there is a patch up. After the cut, you can also patch up. So now the patch up will happen with the corrected gene. So you cut the wrong gene, patch up with the right gene, you corrected the whole uh, thing. So you can, if a person has a genetic problem, you can take the skin cell or blood cell, make the iPSCs. From that iPSC, if you know the genetic disease, use your molecular scissor and molecular patch technique to cut and replace with the right kind of thing. Then you have the corrected cells. These corrected cells you can grow and even differentiate into different kinds of organ. Then either you can use it for study and drug screening, etc. You can even do the personalized uh, drug screening and then you can put it back into the person as a transplant. So all this thing is totally possible with the induced pluripotent stem cell. So induced pluripotent stem cell has huge advantage. One of the biggest advantages, it can do everything that the embryonic stem cell do and more. 
Apart from that, it has far less ethical issues because it's not from the embryo. And you can do personalized stem cell because embryonic stem cells are not personalized, induced pluripotent stem cell. Every person can have make his own induced uh, pluripotent stem cell. And this is part because of it's much easier to grow, much easier to like, you know, do every manipulation. It's better to suited for stem cell therapy because even you can correct the mistake. And it is better suited also for the research and drug as a drug discovery as you can personalize your uh, uh, studies. And more importantly, you can do the reprogramming. I said, if you have the pluripotent cell, you can program it to become any cell, right? A specific kind of your uh, uh, cell. Let's say one kind of brain cell is problematic. Now, instead of making that cell outside in the plate and putting it back into the brain, you can put the pluripotent cell to that part of the brain and program it, poke it in such a way that it actually converts into the neuron which is required in that place. So you are programming the cell where it's required. That is totally possible with induced pluripotent cell. As I already told you, you can do gene correction, not gene correction at somatic cell. You can also do gene correction in this cell, like, you know, in the germline. For example, if parents, both parents know that they have a congenital issue. I mean, it is not expressed in them, but they know if the kid, if they have a kid, the kid will have that problem. In that case, it's possible if you know exactly what's the gene, they can take out their embryos, uh, take out the, the, the like, you know, the uh, germline cells, make the correction and re-implant them. So the offspring then uh, will not have the genetic problem. This is totally possible. Of course, it has huge uh, ethical issues. And we know, as I told you very beginning, if you know the mature cells, how they become pluripotent. If we exactly understand this, and we know that as we grow older, we lose the pluripotent cell and we become age. Aging is one of the main reason we lose even the multipotent cell. Now, if you know exactly which pluripotent and multipotent cells are dying, and if we can replenish them, you can, in theory, reverse the aging. Okay? So, these are all the huge advantages of pluripotent uh, stem cell. And this is really, really growing at a breakneck speed. The whole research in this field is really growing in a breakneck speed. So, but it still has a lot of ethical issues. And one of the thing, you know, for example, I just told you, like, you know, you can correct things in the gym line. And there were reports that such thing happened in China a couple of years ago. A doctor, they reported that he corrected a gene uh, in the baby and they had a twins. And in that twins, the, the, some genes were manipulated. The question is, is it okay for you to correct genes? How do you exactly know is these genes like correcting is okay? Like, you know, this is a huge ethical issue. Can we manipulate? Can we become God? I mean, we are, have become God in many ways, but really when it goes to the gene, we have the BT tomato, BT brinja. Can we also have BT human? Is it okay to have BT human? And would it, what would be the long-term consequences of that? Is it okay to clone humans? What will be the long-term consequences of it? Even if we reverse the aging process, what will be the consequences of it? Though, in theory, all these issues are possible now, it is very important to have a very open discussion and come up with policy to determine and set up guidelines on all these things. Okay? I stop here. I, I think I took more than 45 minutes. I stop here. I really welcome to ask, uh, know your opinions also and ask questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir, uh, for interesting lecture. It was a brainy lecture, you know, we can tell <laughs> that word. And uh, let's, uh, uh, st uh, dear students and teachers, now we have the question and, question and answer session. And I request you to uh, mute your uh, microphone, uh, you can ask or uh, put your questions in the chat box and I'll read out. Yeah, uh, uh, there is a question from uh, Prakasha. Mm -hmm. uh, please explain the difference between uh, uh, totipotency uh, uh, and uh, pluripotency. Yes. And the second question, is it possible to grow the limbs by this uh, pluripotent cells mm -hmm. and which may be, uh, be useful to many uh, physically challenged persons? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. uh, going back to the first question, totipotent and pluripotent. So, my entire talk, I focused only on the pluripotent. For all practical purpose, pluripotent cells are the most important cells. But, 
pluripotent cells are not totipotent. So, but to know the difference between totipotent and pluripotent, we have to go back to the process of embryo development. When the fertilization of egg happens and it divides into four cell, eight cells, or 12 cell, or even 16 cell, till this stage, all the cells are totipotent. After that, once it forms the blastocyst, I told you that uh, uh, the circular structure where there is a one single layer of cells outside and there are multiple cells inside. From that stage onwards, those cells are not totipotent. So what's the difference? So when the embryo is growing, the, um, the early parts of, parts of the cell, they make all parts of our body. Okay. Apart from all parts of body, it also makes the umbilical cord. This umbilical cord is very important to connect the embryo to the mother because during its development, it gets all the nutrients from the mother. Okay. So the early stages of the cell until it becomes blastocyte, all the cells can form. If you take out and differentiate them, all the cells can form not only all your organs, but it can also make the umbilical cord. But if you take the cells after the blastocyte, it can make all your organ but it cannot make the umbilical cord. So that's why these cells are called pluripotent. But the cells which can make also the umbilical cord and the embryo is called totipotent cell. Okay, so with respect to the limbs, yes, one can make limbs, there's no uh, this thing, but I think limb is a much uh, easier uh, things to uh, mend than any other. Like, you know, if your uh, bone is broken, you can actually fix it and it will regrow. See, there are many regions of body Keep the potency to regrow till we die, even liver for that matter. If one part of the liver is dead, other part can take over and it can grow. Even bones, they can keep growing. But many other parts of our body cannot grow. For example, your brain or your heart and even muscles. Once they are da damaged, they cannot regrow. So, yes, we can grow the limb, but it's a far more uh, like you know beneficial to make the other parts which cannot be uh, regrow. Bone, I think it's much easier that they can already grow on its own. Yeah, uh, another question from uh, Chaitra Banu, uh, Government PU College, Jakur. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the role of uh, uh, pluripotent cells forming the bones? And another question, mm -hmm. how much time is needed to grow an organ by these cells? So bone, as I said, like, you know, every uh, pluripotent cell make every part of your body. So like that, it forms your bone also. But as I told, the, the it formed from your uh, uh, endoderm. So they, they will differentiate into ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, right? So the uh, sorry, it's, it's formed from your uh, mesoderm. So pluripotent cell make all the organs, including your bone. So uh, the uh, second question is how long it takes to grow the organs. So it depends what organ they are. If it is like, for example, cornea, it can grow in weeks and uh, like, you know, uh, less than that. And these are already used. The uh, artificially grown cornea can be transplanted. But if you want to grow a heart wall, that's also possible. But if you want to grow a brain, that is at the moment is not possible. Or if you want to grow a whole heart from pluripotent cells, at the moment it's not possible because still it is like, you know, you can guide them to become heart cells. And they can even guide them to become a clump which looks like heart, but it will not exactly become your heart. So we are not still at a stage we can grow heart or brain directly from the pluripotent cells. But in your body, of course, it grows within months. Like you know, pluripotent cell will make heart and everything is there within month. Already in the embryo, the heart will beat within a month. You can get the heartbeat. But taking the pluripotent cells outside, you can grow cornea and some of the organs already been uh, done, but growing a complete organs, complex organs like brain or heart is still not possible. In theory, it is possible. In practice, still not possible. Okay. Question from uh, Vidya Prasanna mm -hmm. uh, from Parikrama Nandini layout. Uh, mm -hmm. What will be the effect if we inject a stem cells in a non-deceased person? Will there any side effect? And uh, is there any disadvantage of stem cells? Well, I mean, there are now already there are many stem cell therapy, so-called stem cell therapy happening. So one very well-known stem cell therapy is for the leukemia, where your bloods, the cells which make your bloods are gone bad. Those you can remove from the affected patient and you can inject the new one, which can make all your blood cells. 
that is totally possible but apart from that lot of hospitals and uh, there are lot of clinics and they are called uh, they are doing so called stem cell therapy so and also stem cells are also injected like you know like botox you might have heard like you know, like botox you can also inject stem cells to the particular part of your face and also that can reju reju rejuvenate your skin and all those things so if the, the, this kind of things done they are generally don't have uh, major side effects but uh, even if you are uh, but of course like any transplant of organ they can your body can react against them right so if you transplant any organ from somebody else your body will attack that the body will think that's a, a, a foreign body and they will attack but if you make a ipsc from your own cell uh, and you inject them back they shouldn't cause any major uh, immune reaction but i don't know what would be the purpose of doing that you would do it only if you want to like you know uh, try to correct something but they are being done like you know even for alzheimer and many other even neurological disease i know that many clinics do something called as stem cell therapy what they do is they just take your own blood purify it isolate the stem cell from that and reinject it back so the idea is the because you have concentrated the stem cell and reinject they will be uh, kind of rejuvenate the reprogramming of cells they can relieve a lot of the symptoms uh, but still they are very dubious i'm not i mean i'm i'm, I'm not actually qualified person to comment on that but is i only thing i can tell is it's not very effective yeah uh, question from uh, jayshree parikrama kormangla is it legal to donate or use one stem cells to others uh, so is it legal for yeah. you to donate a, a stem cell stem cells uh yes there are many uh, like you know this banks so nowadays it's very common that uh, whenever the baby is born uh, baby is born you can store the umbilical cord you can not only store the umbilical cord even i can isolate the stem cell and uh, uh, keep them and if uh, another person require it it's definitely possible to like you know use that stem cell if that person is a match it's definitely possible to uh, uh, transplant them and there of course the some legal guidelines and all those thing but definitely it's possible but you, nowadays it's becoming very common to even store blood also uh, and also the bone marrow or even the umbilical cord uh, stem cells so th those can be legally uh, isolated and stored indefinitely yeah and question from uh, tejaswini mm -hmm. uh, namaste sir to mm -hmm. induce a corrected uh, gene a vector is needed right and can you please explain about the vectors okay very good question i didn't go into the technicalities of this so when you are trying to i told you to make a somatic cell into a pluripotent cell you have to force that cells to express certain genes so how do you force them so you have to first dump this genes into these cells and make them put it under a promoter so they are kick start okay so how do you do that one very effective way to do that is to put this gene in virus there are many kind of virus in which you can remove the viral gene put the genes of your interest but it will still remain the activity as a virus then if you put this virus on the cells they will the genes will be taken up into the cells because this act as a virus the genes go into your body but then once it go into your body they integrate into your nucleus and start expressing okay so the most common way for you to make a cell take up a foreign gene is through viral vectors but viral vectors are sometimes dangerous and also you may not want to uh, like you know get this gene into your nucleus so most of the time if the viral vector if you use it go and get into your nucleus right but where exactly it goes and bumps into your nucleus you don't know you cannot control so that may cause more harm so now the more advanced technology you make the dna go into the nucleus but will not get integrated into the nucleus so you use this plasmid so this plasmid are circular dna you somehow make to go into your cell so you use a lipid based mechanism to for them to enter into your cell they express the protein but they will not get integrated into your cell so there are many ways to get your dna into the cells most common way is using the viral but it has disadvantages so now there are more advanced mechanism by which you can get just using the lipid you can get the dna into your cell or even you can directly use the proteins 
push the proteins into your cells. So that would also work. Yeah. Questions from the school, Chandan. Good morning, sir. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, if uh, reversal of aging is possible by this concept, mm -hmm. uh, is it yes. possible yes. for reversing the age? Yes. In theory, it is possible because, like you know, if you know identify exactly the which the as the cells, uh, uh, like you know, cells will have a timer kind of thing. Most of the cells will have a timer. You probably guys know one of the thing is the uh, telomer. As the cells uh, we grow old, the telomer start becoming shorter and shorter. The uh, the cell replication will be inefficient and so on. Apart from that, also there will be something called accumulation of free radicals. So. These are thought to be some of the reason why we age and also the cells on their own, on their own, many of the cells on their own have intrinsic program to age. Okay, because biologically it's a predestined that we will age and die. But if you know exactly what are these cells and what exactly going wrong. So those organs and those cells can be replenished. Let's say you can, if the heart is growing old, you can use targeted induced pluripotent cells to reprogram that part to replenish it. Like as I'm telling, as your car engine can be replaced with a new engine, it's possible to replace. Then your car age comes down, right? So that way it's possible to reverse the aging. So we, but in that field, actually we, our knowledge is still very, very less. We don't know exactly what's the programming of aging. We know some uh, parts, but we don't know exactly. But some part of the brain and or even some part of the uh, uh, muscle or something can be replaced to make you fit again. I can't say whether it's exactly reversing the age, but they can make you fit and functional again. Yeah. Uh, one question from YouTube. Uh, Nanjun Swami Yam. Sir, the, the cloned animal resemble the, the hmm. parent yeah. who donated the stem cells. Can the intelligence also be transferred? <laughs> Very good question. I don't know whether you can quantify intelligence in the same way as you can quantify muscle power. So it's a little bit difficult what exactly because if, uh, intelligence or your thinking is not exactly totally determined by your genes. It's also uh, to huge extent uh, determined by the environment and the uh, way you grow. So uh, yes. The genetically, it will be exact match of your uh, uh, parent, the, the who donated the somatic nucleus, right? Not the uh, egg donor. It will be exact copy of the somatic donor. So all your feature, your nose, eyes, skin color, everything will be exactly like that parent. Okay, but when it comes to intelligence, as I said, it's very difficult to quantify. So because also it's highly uh, uh, determined by the external factor. So I can't say we, you, you will carry the same, but you will have the almost same process of thinking, I would say. Okay, a last question I'll ask because the, the due to running out of time and uh, uh, one question from Vidya Prasanna, uh, if we are able to alter, uh, replace or rejuvenate the cells by the human body, can immortality be achieved as we progress in this uh, recent technology? Well, as I said, like, you know, we are made up of our cells. If we take out our cell and make it pluripotent and keep it in our, uh, like, you know, uh, culture media or freeze it, it, it will be immortal. So that, that in that sense, when all of us can immortalize our cell, because like we are made up of our cell and cells can be immortalized. That way, like, you know, if you have heard of this uh, cell lines called HeLa cell line or many of these cell lines, actually they are from individual persons. Those persons are now immortalized because of their cells. So, but what you call your cell is like, you know, can you immortalize your cell is a difficult question. So that I don't know. So, but of course you can keep reju rejuvenating your organs. In theory, you can keep reju rejuvenating your organs. You can extend your lifespan. It is definitely possible. Yeah, uh, with kind request, I'll ask one more question from mm -hmm. school Chindan, sir. Yeah. Uh, if uh, there are no pluripotent cells in our body, mm -hmm. what will happen? See, the pluripotent cells, as, you, as I told you in the very beginning, by the time we are born, most of our pluripotent cells are gone. We don't have any more pluripotent cells. But there are still multipotent cells. So you should remember there are pluripotent cells, there are multipotent cells. If there are no pluripotent cells to begin with, you will not be born. You will never form like, you know, yourself. The embryo will never develop. 
but as the embryo develop and the baby is born most of the pluripotentials are gone but you still will have multipotentials and they can remain all through your life because some organs as i said like your liver bone many of this skin they keep reju rejuvenating on itself forever like you know and so those stem cells are there in our body all many of such kind of stem cells are there in our body if you kill all the stem cells of course we will die you nobody can survive because the many parts of our body are constantly for example red blood cells all the red blood cells are replaced within months so there is constant rejuvenation but not every organ that's all but you don't have pluripotentials you only have multipotentials thank you very much sir uh, thank you okay. now it's time for vote of thanks on behalf of cnr of hall of science and education technology unit uh, we express our thanks to professor ravi uh, for giving such a interesting lecture and i thank you uh, professor uh, ravi manjitaya for convening the program i thank chair education technology unit professor t govind raju for his support and guidance we thank the bharat ratna professor cnr rao and dr mrs indumathi rao for their vision and continued guidance and commitment to the popularization of science in india we thank the president of jncsr professor g u kulkarni for extending his support and facilities for this program we thank mr dwarkanath and his team for coordinating the schools and colleges to participate in today's program we thank the all the principals students and teachers from the various colleges who are participating in today's program we thank mr praveen and mr dilip and their technical assistants and the uh, administration of jncsr for providing the infrastructure facilities and administrative support to this program thank you thank you sir once again thank you thank you very much thank you students okay please subscribe the youtube channel you know in future uh, like this uh, very interesting lectures you can you can watch uh, whenever we are live okay please subscribe hall of science channel Thank you.